I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Agro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the February 2018 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Ira Savetsky, PRS Resident Ambassador from NYU, and I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Francesco Agro from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Alexis Hazen, Associate Professor and the Director of Aesthetic Surgery at the hans Jörg Wies Department of Plastic Surgery at NYU. Thank you very much, Dr. Hazen, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. The article we'll be discussing is the addition of PRP to facial lipofilling, a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial by William Sell et al. A quick reminder, all the articles that we will discuss can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. To begin, autologous fat grafting is a powerful tool for facial rejuvenation. It is hypothesized that adipose stem cells in the lipograph contribute to tissue regeneration. So in addition to filling, there may also be regenerative effects on damaged tissues at the cellular level. Platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, mimics nature's own regenerative source of wound healing and has been used by this group as an additive to facial lipofilling since 2005. They hypothesize that the addition of PRP to lipographs augments wound healing by providing an instant scaffold for regeneration as well as a rich source of pro-regenerative growth factors. This hypothesis was tested in the current study. This was a single-center, patient and investigator-blinded, placebo-controlled trial at their center in the Netherlands over a three-year period. In total, there were 32 patients enrolled, half received PRP, and a half received placebo, which was sterile saline. This was performed by a single experienced surgeon. Primary outcome was to analyze improvements in skin elasticity using a validated elasticity probe. Secondary outcomes were changes in skin characteristics such as volumetric changes of the nasolabial fold using a validated grading method at three months and one year post-op. Other secondary outcomes were analyzing recovery time and patient satisfaction using questionnaires. In terms of PRP preparation for the experimental group, 30 cc's of whole blood was drawn from the patient, processed in their preferred device for PRP isolation with 3 cc's of PRP output. Lipo harvesting, processing, and lipofilling were performed following the standard Coleman method. Location and applied lipofilling volume is presented in Figure 3. In addition, a detailed step-by-step -step video description of the lipofilling procedure is available online. Subsequently, PRP or saline was evenly dispersed into these planes by transcutaneous injection using a 22-gauge needle. In terms of their results, 32 patients were enrolled, 25 completed this study. 13 received lipofilling with PRP, and 12 received lipofilling with saline. Mean patient age at the time of operation was 52 years, with no significant age difference between both groups. Whole blood platelet counts were within normal range for all patients. In terms of their primary outcome, analyzing changes in skin elasticity, lipofilling with or without PRP did not significantly change overlying skin elasticity. In terms of secondary outcomes, volumetric changes of the nasolabial fold data at three months and at one year showed no significant differences between both groups. Interestingly, the addition of PRP sped up recovery but did not increase patient satisfaction. Patients that received PRP returned to work or social activities faster than the control group, nine days versus 15 days. Patient satisfaction, changes in volume and skin quality reported after six months proved to be similar in both groups. Overall, I think this was an excellent study. The authors should be applauded for designing a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded study investigating the possible beneficiary effects of adding PRP to facial lipofilling. Thus far, the use of PRP as an additive in lipofilling has shown great promises in vitro. However, this has only partially been reproduced in a clinical setting. In figure six, they show that the reversal in the correlation of net elasticity as a function of patient age may suggest some form of rejuvenation that is enhanced by PRP, but did lack significance with the number of patients in the study. However, the results clearly demonstrate that the addition of PRP to the lipograph significantly reduces patients' reported recovery time. One potential pitfall that the authors discuss is what they call the concentration paradox. Previous studies have shown that a higher concentration of PRP or more platelets may produce counterproductive effects, possibly by unwanted cell differentiation. 
Most commercially available PRP kits capture a percentage of available platelets from whole blood, not a certain quantitative number of platelets. Therefore, the cumulative amount of growth factors in kit isolated PRP is inconsistent. This is a potential weakness of this study as well as other clinical studies. Another factor to consider is that the local growth factor milieu after lipofilling remains unclear. The release of platelets and pro-inflammatory factors due to damage caused by the lipofilling procedure itself could be of such an extent that the addition of PRP actually is insignificant, redundant, or potentially too high. Further studies are, are needed to determine the optimal use and concentrations of PRP. We know PRP is a hot topic and it's a trending therapy, not just in plastic surgery for facial rejuvenations and androgenic alopecia, but also in other disciplines such as orthopedics and wound care. Patients are aware of it and are interested in receiving it. Dr. Hazen, you have a, a paper coming up in PRS in a few months that's reviewing the PRP literature critically. What are your thoughts about this paper and how do you think it stands up to what has previously been published? I totally agree with you that the authors should be applauded for their placebo-controlled randomized trial because that's the problem with most of the studies that are out there and most of the information in the literature. It's not placebo-controlled. And as you could see from the fallout of this paper, you know, they had to make patients not use other products, not undergo surgery. And that's pretty hard for this patient population who is interested in this. And they lost, I think, seven patients to that. So I think they should be applauded for that. But in terms of the literature, one of the biggest problems is that we don't know how to process PRP and if one way of processing it is better. And you mentioned about the concentration. So we don't know in terms of volume whether it's better to inject more volume or less volume. There are some methods of processing that quantify the, the amount in terms of the platelets. But again, there haven't been enough studies to know what is exactly preferred. So it would be nice to see some studies that look at that. I think one of the interesting aspects of the results was that the patients didn't really feel that there was much of an effect, but that was ultimately at six months. And in other papers, patients noted a more transient positive effect, but the time frame was more like three weeks to four weeks. So you wonder if there's sort of a trail off in the positive effects. Those are really good points, and that's just really interesting. Francesco, what did you think of the paper? Well, I thought it was a great paper, and I'd like to say that I completely agree with all the comments that have been made so far. I think the role of PRP is more established in the wound healing uh, realm than in facial rejuvenation. For this reason, just like you and uh, Dr. Hazel, I congratulate the authors for providing a high level of evidence with their clinical trial. And it is refreshing since there is a true paucity of level one and two evidence in the plastic surgery literature. I would like to add to Iris' point that one of the weaknesses of the study, in my opinion, is how volume retention was measured. It is very subjective and hard to truly judge as time goes by. I know that the authors tried to use a 3D visualization. While clinical examination to determine retention may be considered, Dr. Hazen, would you consider the volumetric analysis satisfactory? And would you consider the need for MRI, CT scanning, or more objective measures to determine fat retention? I think for the purposes of a study, it would be really nice to have an MRI. I wouldn't subject patients to a CAT scan just because of the radiation, but I think an MRI is an excellent way to gauge fat retention or even, you know, some of the 3D scanning models are considered very, very accurate. So that would be a way to do it as well. Do you think those 3D scanners would be accurate enough for facial rejuvenation? Because I know they have been used for larger volumes of lipofilling. You know, I wonder if injecting 2 cc's or 3 cc's might be detected. And maybe that's the issue that the authors had. Yeah, I think that is probably the issue. You know, it's certainly for much larger volumes, they're very effective. But usually the problem with MRI is just cost and then it becomes cumbersome to studies. And ultrasound tends to be a little bit user dependent and a little bit harder to be completely objective on. But ideally an MRI would have been nice. One other thing I wanna point out about the study that I really liked is I think that in the literature in our journals, we only see positive results and it's very refreshing to see 
kind of what we would consider almost the negative result. And they did, I think, effectively prove that the greatest benefit of PRP is probably that it shortens the recovery. And that seemed to be statistically significant. And so there are practitioners who are using PRP in combination with a facelift to improve recovery and healing. And that might be what comes out of this paper as a change in clinical practice. But I think it's very refreshing to see that it really didn't do that much and that the effects were moderate and not statistically significant. What about you, Nikki? What were your thoughts about this paper? I think we literally just touched on a lot of the aspects of the paper that I had been sort of mulling over, which are, you know, how do we take something which is by its nature, you know, subjective? Does this look good? Do I like it? And how do we apply objective measures to it? And, you know, I think certainly some of the discussion points we brought up here, question of imaging can be considered for future studies. Dr. Hazen, as someone who's, you know, looked into this topic pretty extensively yourself, I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on what you think the greatest potential benefit of PRP is and how we should be focusing our future studies. Anecdotally, there has been a lot of evidence that it helps with rejuvenation of tendons. If you look at the orthopedic literature, they're using it regularly for injuries and for inflammation. So there does seem to be some sort of positive benefit in terms of inflammation, and that may be why it was helpful in recovery. I mean, ideally, it would be really nice to design a study where you could actually do biopsies of the skin. So, you know, in terms of IRB approval, that's not generally accepted, but in some sort of operation where you're removing skin anyway, it would be nice to see whether it has an effect on a molecular level. And I think, to me, there's something to do with inflammation that it's reducing, and that may be the effect. You know, the other indication is in people who have alopecia. They're using it to promote hair growth. And again, a lot of times when patients have alopecia and the cause is unknown, they respond to steroids, which probably reduces inflammation, and they seem to respond to PRP also. What about the challenge that's already been brought up about, you know, concentrations of PRP and how to prepare it? Are there in vitro studies that we should be designing to take a look at that? Or how can we sort of get everybody on board with using this product in the same way? That's a problem. It became commercially marketable before all the results were revealed from the studies. And I think that's the problem. So now you have an industry that can benefit from marketing this stuff, and we don't really know which way to prepare it. So it would be great to have a controlled study looking at different preparations of it and see if there's any difference. Practically speaking, I don't think that's going to (laughs) happen, but that would be the ideal. Those are some really great points. I think I'll end with this last question. So what should we be telling our patients? How should we be counseling them? What should we be telling our friends and family when they're asking about this in terms of efficacy? I think the best you can say is that it is not harmful and it seems to be safe. And I think that that's very important. In all the studies, there seems to be a very high level of safety, low complications, or, you know, if any. And I think probably the best indication is in promoting healing. So I think in combination with other cosmetic procedures to speed up recovery, I think that we can moderately say. I think telling people that their tendons are gonna heal or that they're gonna look younger or their hair is gonna grow, I think would be really be misleading. Great, I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Thank you everyone for a great discussion. Remember to tune in to the other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast as well as the PRS Journal Club podcast that will be broadcast every month. Also, please join us this month for PRS Journal Club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly with this month's selected article's authors. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Hazen, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, guys. 